Uh, so data input, sometimes you'll see this as data IO uh, for data input and output. Um, but yeah, we're just going to cover getting your data into R today. Um, and we'll cover data output in a different day. All right. And let me make sure I've got my R Studio. Yes. Great. All right. Data input. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of setup first uh, to make our lives easier. OK, so R Studio and um, and uh, basically their their environment have made uh, working with files that are not part of R Studio a little easier. Um, so data that you're reading in or working with um, to make that a little easier to find on your computer. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about how to do some data import or uh, reading in data manually. So a point and click way to do it. And that's perfectly fine if that's uh, going to meet your needs. But then we'll talk about a little bit uh, more programmatic way to do that. So using code to bring data directly into your um, into your R session so that you can work with it. Um, and in a way that is reproducible. Obviously, other folks can't point and click and follow that without really detailed directions. OK. All right, so our setup. We're going to set up an R project. So uh, let's kind of go over the steps first, and then I'll, I'll walk us through that on RStudio. OK, um, so we want to make an R project so we can stay organized. Um, this is just sort of a unit that keeps everything together. Um, when you're working on a project in R. Uh, so we'll use the new project button to do this. This is on the top left, right where you're going to see your uh, button to create a new R markdown file. We'll go through the menu. We'll do a new directory. We're going to just create a folder from scratch. And we're going to create a new project. And we're going to give it a name such as intro to our class. This could be whatever you want to call it, you know, uh, research project um, on um, disease outbreaks, something like that, whatever makes sense to you um, when you create these projects on your own. All right. And once you create that, it should be visible uh, somewhere that's easy to find. You know, you can put this in your documents. Um, if you work on something like Dropbox, that's fine too. Um, or uh, on your desktop. Yeah, quick question. So a couple things. Um, so for uh, an R project that I'm creating on my desktop, like as long as I don't share my computer with somebody, nobody else can see that. It's not really connected to the internet um, in a way that's going to compromise data security. Um, so as far as code goes, um, a lot of times what people will do is they'll share code in a publication, but they won't share the raw data. So sharing code, um, as long as there's not, um, you know, things that are hard coded in there or data that's hard coded in your, in your um, R Markdown document, that should also be uh, pretty secure. It's always good to have somebody take a second look at it. Um, and uh, as far as like protecting uh, data, you know, if you have a secure, um, you know, cloud platform or something you're, you're storing your data on. Um, and uh, you can access data in all kinds of different ways. So this is just kind of what we're going over is accessing files locally, but there's tons of ways to access data in R. So um, I don't want to make any huge assumptions here, but um, for a lot of different data sources, you you have options, right? So. Um, depending on what you're using to store your data, um, you can create, or there are often add-on packages for interacting with those sources. Okay, so uh, this project folder is going to make it easier to work with something like an Excel file or a, a, a comma delimited file. Um, so let's walk through how this works in um, in um, in our studio. OK, so uh, I mentioned I've got this uh, new project button. So I'm going to go ahead and click that. And it'll ask me, do I want to save uh, first? So actually, let's save my notes. And uh, I don't 
care about the workspace image. This is just uh, some of the environmental variables. Um, I generally don't do that because um, I should be able to recreate what I did from my code. So I'm going to say don't save. And we're creating a new project. I'm going to create a new directory. And I want a new project. And I'm going to give it a name such as intro to R uh, June or 2023. And I'll create that on my desktop. All right, so it's basically cleaned up my environment for me. It's created a brand new uh, project. And if I go to this drop down menu on the top right, I can switch among my projects. You see, I already had kind of created one um, for this class, but I'll, I'll go to this new one that I just created. OK, um, so any questions about that setup? I know that's a little uh, a little tricky. We're doing things uh, on our computer, creating directories. Um, we should be able to see this um, on my desktop now. So right there. Yeah, so good question. Should we load libraries uh, as the first few lines of code? So let's say uh, I wanted to create a new markdown, R markdown, um, and I can actually get rid of all of this and create an R chunk. And let's say I want to load the JHUR library. Perfect. You can definitely do that. Okay, always good to be prepared. All right, so um, I've set up my R project, and this is going to make our life a little easier uh, as far as organizing our files and for R to know where to look for them. Okay, so let's get data into R uh, with the manual point and click method. So um, just to reiterate, reading data into R is really the first step of any real project or analysis. There's some built in data sets in R that you can play with, but we all know that our real data is more fun. Um, R can read almost any file format, especially via add on packages. So working with SAS data or working with uh, Stata data, for example. Um, and we're going to focus on simple delimited files. Um, you can work even on like image files and things like that, but that's a little bit less common. Uh, so we'll work with comma separated files, tab separated, and um, Excel files. Just they're the most common and usually pretty um, straightforward file format. Okay, um, so the JHUR package has some data sets in case some of this isn't working for you. You know, for example, you've got like a firewall or something that's going on. Um, the JHUR package can help us get around some of that issue, those issues. All right, um, so we're going to work with a data set called the Youth Tobacco Survey. Uh, so it was developed to provide states with comprehensive data um, on both middle school and high school students regarding whether they were smoking, whether they are trying to stop um, their ability to purchase tobacco and things like that. So, um, you know, familiarity with advertising and things like that. So um, in an effort to better understand uh, youth uh, tobacco use. So uh, you can check the data out here. It is real data. <laughs> um, and we're going to be uh, working with this for the next couple uh, slides. All right, uh, so you can get this file, uh, this set of data uh, online at this URL. And uh, typically, uh, you can just click this link and it should download it for you. Um, they work, it works a little bit different in different browsers. So uh, I'll go ahead and click this and see what happens. Um, so it kind of automatically downloads in the background for me. Um, but you might have to right click and save it. Um, depending on your browser. Okay, um, so 
uh, let's talk about how to actually import this into our studio. So uh, I've got my instructions here. I'll first go to file uh, and then import data set. We're going to do from text read R. Uh, so that's a specific package that helps read in data. We're going to paste the URL and then we're going to click uh, just the button to import it. So let's just copy this preemptively. All right, we'll go to file. We'll go to import data set. And from text read R. All right. I'll go ahead and paste that link in there. And uh, importantly, I have to get R to recognize this. So let's go ahead and click update. Um, and you'll see you get a little preview of the data here. And uh, we're seeing some code down here, which was, is kind of nice, right? It's writing the code for us um, because it knows uh, that we want to read some data in. So uh, let's go ahead and import that. All right. What just happened? Let's talk about this. OK, here's a SIGIF if you want to refer to that later. OK, so what just happened? We see uh, now a preview of the data on the, and let, let me just show you over here, uh, see a preview of the data uh, on the top left. So now we have this kind of spreadsheet looking thing. We also have some code that happened down here. Right, so when we started R, we got this startup message, um, but uh, in the console, it produced some of this code. So it said library read R, so it loaded a package for us, and it created uh, a data set that read in a CSV file. Got some output here, and then uh, saw this code, code here. Okay, so some stuff happened in the console. And uh, we also now have a new object in our environment. And we can see this is a little bit bigger than what we were just working with, right? So we've got uh, about uh, almost 10,000 lines of data. OK, uh, new object. And we ran some code. All right, so this can uh, work really similarly if we're looking for a file on our computer. So let's say uh, I wanted to import a data set from read R and I wanted to browse. Let me go to downloads um, and actually download that data first probably would help. Um, so let me go back here. We're going to save it to downloads. All right, thanks for that link. All right, there we go. <laughs> All right, and back to R. We'll go ahead and browse and grab that data. And uh, you can see the code here looks a little different. Remember before I had a URL here, and now I have uh, a file path. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, but this file is located in my downloads folder. OK, and so that might be in a slightly different. This might look a little bit different um, for you. OK, um, and uh, we can see our assignment arrow. It's given that object that it's reading in. It's giving it a name. So I can do that too. Okay, now I have two that are have slightly different names, <laughs> but they are the same thing. Okay, um, so yeah, we can browse on our machine and pull in data that way. Uh, so manual import, pros and cons. Pros, it's easy. All I have to do is click that uh, menu item and I can import my data set. Uh, but the cons are is, is obscuring some of what's happening, right? We don't actually um, know the code off the top of our head or kind of know what that code should look like. It's just sending it right to the console for us. Um, and unless we point people to exactly um, the data sets and 
uh, the functions that we're using, other folks might have trouble recreating what we did. So there are pros and cons, and, and uh, we're not going to say which is, is right for you, but um, there are things to keep in mind. All right. So let's summarize uh, this part. We have a, a quick review of this whole process that might be helpful. But uh, in general, we're going to use file, import data set from text, read R, paste that URL, and uh, update and import. OK, so let's get a little practice doing that before we come back and talk about how to do this programmatically. All right, um, so let's get our data into R directly, like I said. Uh, so you should have gotten a little bit of a preview, a little flavor of this when you use the drop down menu to bring your data into R. Um, but we're going to need to do a couple things if we want to do this manually. First off, uh, what you may be wondering, like what was read R, right? What was this thing that we were pointing to? Uh, so read R is a package, right? We talked in uh, yesterday about packages being add on collections of functions. They kind of help things uh, work a little bit better and add increased functionality to R. So the read R package, we're going to kind of load it in using library. So uh, if I'm going to go back to uh, my code here, like let's say, all right, I'm going to say library uh, read R. OK, and I already have this installed, so it's going to show up for me. I can run that. Uh, you may have to install it. I believe it's part of JHUR, but uh, you may have to go ahead and install that too. Um, and then we want to use this special function read underscore CSV. OK, so uh, let's say I want my data. I'm going to call it my data. We want this to be. Uh, read in using that function. So we'll do read underscore CSV. But then we have to tell read underscore CSV, where do I get it from, right? I'm going to read something, turn it into an object, but where do I look? So uh, we're going to tell it file, and we're going to give it a URL. So let's copy that. All right. And let's go ahead and run that. All right, so uh, now have three versions of the same data. This one's called my data. Um, but I read that in uh, programmatically, which is kind of nice. I can run this chunk uh, as many times as I need to. And uh, there's a handy function called head that will help you look at the first couple of lines of your data. So if I do head, I say my data. Um, it should show me the first couple of lines. I can specify if I just want two lines. I can tell it that um, if I wanted to just look at a shorter chunk. All right, so once again, uh, I'm creating a new object called my data. I'm using the left hand arrow to assign it. And I'm using the function read underscore CSV to contact this URL, read it in and save it as that object, OK? All right, so uh, we talked a little bit about this in uh, my previous lab, but uh, let's talk a little bit about declaring arguments. So up to this point, we've been telling R explicitly what each argument is. You know, we said um, x is equal to my sequence and times is equal to five. Like we, we've been very clear about what those arguments are. Uh, but R is smart. It can usually guess what you're trying to do. And so uh, read R says, all right, well, when you're using the read underscore CSV function, I bet the first thing you give it is some kind of path or some kind of URL. And so it assumes, uh, without you having to tell it that that's the file, it assumes that's what you're doing. So this will work the same exact way. So uh, in this case, uh, read 
underscore CSV with the file argument is the same as just not declaring that specific argument. Okay, uh, so this is a little tricky. Um, so typically that first argument R can guess, but as you get more complicated and have more arguments to your functions, this can get kind of confusing. So I think it's best practice to tell R exactly what you mean. Okay, um, so questions about that. That's a little bit of a tricky concept, um, and I want us to just kind of have it at the back of our mind. Yeah, question? Yes, yes, this is actually a really common problem. Um, so I'm glad you brought this up. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm going to have a hard time reproducing it here. But when you copy links, sometimes the uh, quotation marks get copied as like a weird like ASCII character. And so it, it's what it's reading is this. OK, so try retyping your quotation marks and see if that helps. Because uh, I should get that same error if I do uh, this here. Yeah, so see, it's unexpected slash. Is it working? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> All right, we'll keep going. Um, OK, so wh what's actually happening? What is read underscore CSV doing? Um, so it parses a flat text file, so some kind of information that's delimited. And it's going to turn it into a fancy data frame called a tibble. Uh, so this is a rectangular data frame where data are split into rows and columns, just like our Excel spreadsheet or our database um, sheet. Um, and so first, that file is parsed into matrix format. Uh, and this is like nitty gritty, not something we need to memorize. Um, and then second, read underscore CSV guesses what each type of column is so does do you have a number in this column do you have text uh, what's that column called do you have column names all of that kind of information all right so um read underscore csv can do things besides read from a url um, but the main thing it needs is just something with the file argument so the file is the path to your file in quotation marks, make sure that they're, again, not the, the weird character. Um, so it can be a path to a file on a website, or it can be a path to somewhere on your local computer. Um, so it could be an app, and we'll talk about this in a second, uh, absolute file path or a relative file path. So here we've got uh, our URL, kind of what we've been seeing so far. Um, but let's talk about these first two here. Um, so this first one, um, I say read underscore CSV, just like we have been, and I'm giving it the file argument. Um, and then I'm giving it this long chain of folders on my computer. So it's like users, Ava Hoffman, downloads, and then finally the CSV file, OK? Um, so that is my absolute path. It's like. I know exactly where you are in the universe of this laptop or this computer, and I'm going to give you the precise address. Um, this next example is what we call a relative path. So R is assuming you're working in a specific place. Like, let's say you're working on your desktop, and it's going to start looking there first and look for your file there, uh, ignoring the rest of your computer. So uh, here, it's assuming that wherever I'm working, that this CSV file is present. OK, so this is a very confusing concept, right? Uh, reading in from your computer, where is your path? Where do things get saved? Sometimes it's not clear, right? Um, so we're going to hopefully give you the tools to figure that out. Um, so luckily, we already set up an R project. This is going to be so, so helpful for us. OK, so going back to R um, and going to my files, right? Remember that I created uh, this folder here a moment ago. OK.
All right, so I can see the files that are in that folder here. Right now, I don't really have very much going on. Um, but let's say I want to take um, the, I've got my, uh, my downloads here, and I'm just going to take this, um, this file, and I'm going to put it in that folder that I created for this project. So I'm going to do a little window shenanigans here and go back to my finder and take that all the way over here into the project. Okay, let me get rid of that. Um, and so now I can see that this file is in uh, that directory and I can preview it here. Um, and so this is going to make my life easier because this is where R assumes that I am working, right? I created this project. It's uh, going to be what's called my relative path uh, or my working directory. So um, I can access this file a lot easier than if it was just in some random place on my computer. OK, uh, and looks like we got a quick question in the chat about read underscore versus read dot CSV. Uh, so read dot CSV, well, and we'll talk about this in a moment, but it's a base R function versus read underscore CSV is a read R function. So they're slightly different packages of functions and they work slightly differently, but I'll talk about why we use the, the read R one in a moment. OK. So uh, I confirmed that my file was actually in that folder. So let me go and take a look. Um, and uh, yay, I can see it in my file browser. Hopefully, you should be able to see it too. Uh, so we can confirm it's there. And so now that I have that data in my working directory, the place that I'm doing my project, uh, I can read it in just using the file name. So let's say my data number two, we're going to read CSV. And uh, we should be able to tab and autocomplete because R is smart. It knows where we're working. Um, and I'm just going to fill it in with this file. And ta-da read the data in programmatically. I didn't have to do any drop down menus. Uh, we're, we're all good here. OK, so as I said, this file is in your working directory. So your working directory is your folder um, or directory that RStudio assumes that you're working in. Uh, it's where R is looking for the files. So sometimes we, uh, you know, when we've created a project, maybe we've moved around, we're navigating between projects, or we don't have a project open, you can adjust your working directory if you need to. So this can be kind of like an SOS, kind of fix things um, and tell R where you should be looking for files. Uh, so you can go to uh, more and go to working directory to locate your working directory. So. Uh, that's this gear button here, and go to working directory. Um, and I was already there, so we're all good here. Um, you can also use um, the command uh, get wd for get working directory to print where um, where R is working. OK, so setting up your R project can really help you avoid headaches by telling R that the working directory is wherever this R proj file is. That's what it's looking for. OK, so having that folder and that project set up can save us a lot of headaches. All right. Uh, so let's uh, let's have a little fun. Let's get organized um, and create a data folder in our files pane uh, on on the bottom right. So uh, let's navigate back. I'll shrink this down just one more time. Uh, so I'm going to click this button to create a new folder, and let's call it data, uh, and help us stay organized here. Uh, and um, let's go ahead and move this file into the data directory. And I want to say I have to um, manually move it. Yep. Um, so we'll go ahead and select and 
move to the data directory. All right, so keeping things organized, if I click on data, I can see that file once more. But hold on, I, I changed the organization of the files, right? So if I run this again, it doesn't know where to look because the file is no longer here where the rproj file is. So to fix that, all I have to do is work on that relative path and say, OK, but in relation to that rproj file, uh, where should I be looking? So we'll go ahead and add data and have our look in the data file relative to the R project file. Okay, so that read in with no errors, all good. All right, so just recapping that, we clicked the new folder button, we moved our YTS data to the data directory, and we had to update our path. Um, and we confirmed the data was read in OK. Um, so we could call this my data three. Let's just make sure that worked OK. Yes, all looking good. All right. OK, so let's um, work on a little bit on checking data and talking about other formats. OK, uh, so the view function can show uh, data in a tab in spreadsheet format. So be careful if your data is really huge. You may have seen with the vaccinations data that it kind of started loading after a moment of scrolling. Um, so you can use the view function for that. Um, but you can also click this, uh, this table button right here to view the data. So that's right there, um, and it will pop up the data for you. So uh, we did talk about the structure function uh, earlier, which can tell us a little bit about data and objects in general, like the classes and such. Um, but when we have something that's a little more complicated, it's not a vector anymore. Uh, it's a data frame or a tibble. Um, it actually is smart. It knows that we're curious about every single column. And so it gives us that information as well. So. We are to go over here and say, all right, um, I want to know what the structure of my data three is. OK, so it gives me lots of information. It's saying, all right, well, um, you have a data value that is a type uh, double, which we'll talk about in a little bit. It's the numeric type of data. But I have a lot in here that's character type. It's text. Uh, and then I can scroll up and see all kinds of information about these different columns and get a little preview. So uh, for the years, I can see, OK, 2015's in there. Uh, for the location abbreviation, I can see that we've got Arizona, you know, maybe some other states as well. OK, so we've talked a little bit about read underscore csv it is kind of a special version of another function called read underscore delim and so this is a really general purpose function to read any file that is delimited in such a way into a data frame so let's say you have something that is tab delimited or you have something that's delimited by i don't know like colons something like that all of those will work with this function but we do have to give it one extra argument. So read to limb, it's going to need the path to your file. So we're going to need to tell it, OK, file equals something. And uh, we also need a delim argument. So what is the character that is actually separating the entries in each line of data? So if we take a look at some of these examples, we've got uh, read to limb, we've declared a file, and we've given it a URL. Um, but we got to tell it, okay, well, 
I'm going to read this in, but you got to tell me what character to parse the data by. So that's where this backslash t comes in. This is what we, uh, the uh, character denotation of a tab. So if you had, um, you know, spaces delimited or something like that, you could just have a space in here in quotes. Um, so another example, you know, we're reading in a file, uh, maybe it's delimited by pipe um, and uh, we could read that in as well. Yeah, so great uh, point in the chat. Could you read underscore delim with CSV and make delim a comma? Absolutely. Um, so um, let's say I wanted to uh, do my data. We're just creating a zillion copies of this data set. Uh, read delim. Let's read from data. Uh, and I'm going to just auto complete that. Um, and then delim is equal to comma, and that should read in exactly the same way. So if you're like, I don't want to remember another function, but I can remember delim, that's perfectly viable. OK, so we're going to get a little tricky. You cannot read an Excel file from a URL. This is just like kind of one of those things. Um, and uh, the, the function that does this just doesn't uh, have that capability. Uh, so we're going to actually need to load a different package to read Excel data into R. Um, so we'll need the read Excel package to do this. And we'll go ahead and load it with library. So let me create a new chunk, just keep things separate. Um, so we'll need to do library read Excel. Okay, and run that. And when we work with read Excel, uh, the function is very similar to the other ones we've been working with. It's read underscore Excel. Uh, but instead of the argument being called file, it's called path. I know it's a little, uh, a little silly, um, but it's just a little bit different. Okay. Uh, so there are tons and tons of R packages to read data types that, you know, anything imaginable, right? So if you've worked with SAS, SPSS data, um, you can read that in with the Haven package. So you'd have to load that just like read Excel. Um, and then those functions look something like this. Okay. Um, so we're not going to talk too much about that, but if that's something that you're curious about, uh, you know, you can do a quick Google search of the Haven package and, and read up a little bit about that. Okay, so I mentioned before there are base R functions rather than the read R package. Uh, read.delim and read.csv, these come by default with R. Um, they have a little bit different syntax and they process the headers of your data a little bit differently. So they don't like any special characters. So if you have dashes and uh, you know spaces in your in your headers, uh, they they will not like that and will replace everything with periods. Um, and then the other thing is that um, the read R functions are much faster. The way they work under the hood uh, is going to be faster for large data sets. So uh, we just try to recommend that you use the read R versions. Not that there's anything wrong with the other ones. They're just, they work a little bit differently. Okay. Um, okay, yeah. So for read Excel, do we need to deposit the files into the working directory? Yeah, so if we were reading in something like this, right, that asthma file would need to be in the working directory. But if I had placed this in the data folder, I could do a path that's something like data slash asthma. Um, and you could read from the absolute path, such as, um, you know, uh, users, Ava, downloads, um, uh, slash asthma. It can, it can be from an absolute path as well. OK, um, so common mistakes uh, that we see uh, is just R can't find the file. And this usually means that the path is not quite right. Um, and so hopefully R 
uh, our projects can help with that because it's establishing a working directory that you know where it is. Um, again, typos, try to use that tab auto completion when you can. It can be really helpful for avoiding, you know, spelling and slight typos. Uh, watch out for those open quotes, uh, parentheses, brackets, of course. Um, and uh, deleting part of a code chunk, this is always like very frustrating. So if I go here and uh, I've kind of accidentally deleted this and I try to run, it's like, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure what you're doing. Um, so make sure you don't delete parts of, of the chunk here. All right, so uh, one of the most important skills, okay, and at the end of the day, I know, uh, for any function, you can write a question mark, and actually any package as well, you can write a question mark uh, followed by the function name to get some help. So if you're like, uh, I totally forgot how read underscore CSV works, I could type in question mark, excuse me, read underscore CSV, and get some documentation for this function. So what does it do? It reads a delimited file into a tibble. And so looking at this might seem a little intimidating. Um, I know it definitely was for me at first, uh, but over time, uh, this does become easier to understand, but it can be a good starting place for getting more information about how something works, especially scrolling down to the usage. You could say, oh, it takes an argument called delim, not path or not a marker or something like that, if you happen to forget what it's called. So again, that's question mark followed by the function name. You can also set the working directory um, manually. Uh, so this can sometimes cause problems down the road, um, but that way you can specify where you want R to look for files. So you can do that if you need to. Um, and then finally, uh, the sometimes when you're knitting a document that's looking for files, sometimes the knit directory and the working directory are not always matched. So you can uh, double check that by clicking the knit drop down menu and selecting the current working directory. So they're just so they're in alignment. You can also do this manually with set WD. This is what I do when I'm feeling very impatient. So it's not best practice, but um, I am guilty of doing this. All right, so let's summarize what we've talked about for this part two. Again, reading the data in programmatically. So functions from the read R package, usually we're referring to read underscore CSV and read underscore delim. It does have some other functions, but we won't talk too much about those. Um, so this is great for reading in comma delimited data. So usually a dot CSV file we need to uh, provide a file path to these functions because it's got to know where to look. And it's going to return a tibble, which is a fancy data frame. So if you remember, it's uh, if I were to type in vaccinations, um, it's a fancy data frame. It's got, uh, it's, we're describing kind of what uh, the each column type is and um, it just uh, is organized really nicely for us to look at. Finally, uh, our projects are a really good way to keep your files organized and reduce headaches of trying to find files on your computer. It can be real tricky. Um, so use get working directory or kind of go through those point and click menus to figure out what your working directory is if it's you're still having issues uh, and the R project has not kind of cleared those up for you. always, always want to look at our data, right? We don't want to take the format and the, um, the shape of our data for granted, right? We want to inspect things, right? We got to get in the weeds a little bit. So there's a couple functions you can use to just take a look. I particularly like this view one because it looks like a spreadsheet, right? It's pretty easy to navigate, but you can also use functions like glimpse, head, tail, 
uh, to get a look at certain rows of your data. And then uh, other file types, read R has, again, read delim is great for general purpose delimited files. And read Excel is great for those Excel files you might have to read in. Okay, and uh, we won't talk too much about this, but um, read Excel has options of, you know, what sheet you want to pull from, um, what columns you want to pull out of the Excel file. So it's not just like you have to pull it in and it's like, what do I do? You can specify some of that um, from the beginning. And finally, uh, don't forget to use this left arrow to assign your read in data to an object, because if you just read the data and don't save it as an object, uh, it reads and disappears. <laughs> so you did all that work for, for no reason. Um, so make sure you use this arrow to assign it. 